Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a tag video for Tag Tuesday. This is the Dark Academia book tag which I first saw on Andrea at Infinite Text's channel and I'll post the link to that. Now I think I'm in the wrong generation to know what Dark Academia is. Um, Andrea talks about it and gives <laughs> gives a definition which is interesting but sort of blows my mind um, when she describes it as sort of uh, the 50s and 60s beats meets Harry, the Harry Potter generation. Um, so I'm not going to take that any further. Um, but what I really like about uh, about this was the questions, the prompts, I think, are fantastic. So um, in my full ignorance of what dark academia is, let's go. Uh, question one, what is your favourite academia or dark book? And it also says plus movie, but I'm going to ignore the movie. So I've got three books. Um, which I think uh, qualifies academia. The first is The Seventh Function of Language by Laurent Binet. And I don't know if you can see that's Roland Barthes uh, behind the, uh, the sort of redaction. Um, and this is a book about academic ideas and academics such as um, Louis Althusser, um, Jacobson, um, Foucault, uh, lots of these sort of thinkers about semiotics and, and things like that. But you don't need to know their theories. This is about their the individual foibles and flaws as human beings. It's incredibly funny, but it is also very clever and it takes you through some of these ideas. And it's about the role of symbol uh, in, in everyday life uh, as analysed sort of academically. It's a really, really good book. And it's a sort of a murder mystery as well. The second is Michel Houellebecq, another French writer called Submission, which posits that the, an Islamic party wins the French general election and that they, they demand that all civil servants must convert to uh, Islam, not a sort of radical Islam, but just Islam. So uh, the book is from a point of view of an academic who is studying uh, the decadent writer um, J.K. Huismans. So really the sort of the antithesis of any kind of religious faith, although Huismans himself was very, very religious, very, very Catholic. Um, and he, he's sort of debating with fellow uh, teachers, uh, professors, you know, should he convert or should he not? And, so, you know, I think it's Hoylbeck's best book. It's it's slightly muted, which is probably good in Hoylbeck's case. It takes some of the rough edges off. But it's also the most internally consistent because he's a, he's a bit ill-disciplined as a writer. But I really enjoyed this and thought it was fabulous. And the third is Scarlett Thomas, uh, Oligarchy, which is her comeback novel after a couple of books for children. Um, because uh, I fell in love with her as an author for her, uh, you know, uh, adult novels. And this is the first one in a while. It's set in a girls' boarding school in a new town in, in England. And it's not only the menstrual cycles of all the girls that comes into um, coming to sync, but also their sort of neuroses and, and, and manias. And it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a really enjoyable book. Again, a bit of a sort of murder mystery theme to it. Question two, uh, what dead poet would you like to have a drink with? Well, I don't drink, um, so if they'll allow me a soft drink. I guess my initial answer to this was John Milton, writer of Paradise Lost. Um, but, and I don't think he'd drink either, because I think he was slightly on the sort of puritanical wing of Christianity, which makes me think that actually he'd be a bit of a, a, bit of a bore, really, around a, a sort of a dinner table. Uh, on the plus side, um, he's blind, or he was blind, so uh, I could uh, fill my boots with uh, the, the best picks of the food, and he wouldn't know any different. Um, I, you know, I love his ideas. I'm not sure how much of a conversationalist he, he would make. So given that, I think I would go for um, Rilke, Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, the German poet, just because I think we could, we could have a look around on, on our dinner table and just get to the sort of the essential core of, of some of the things that we see that we could really dig deep and, and discuss and, 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 and sort of deconstruct them, really. So I think that would be an interesting experience uh, in, a, in a poetic vein from his point of view, obviously. Uh, three, what is your favourite painting and or, and or sculpture? Well, the sculptures, I'm a big fan of Rodin. Um, not the thinker so much, but there's one with a cut pair of lovers. I've got a postcard of it around here somewhere. Um, a pair of lovers, but he leaves, you know, they are beautifully smooth and sort of marble effect, but the rock 
from which they've been carved and from which they rest is, is left in its full sort of gnarled texture. And I just think that contrast is fabulous. Painting, well, you know, Mark Rothko. Uh, I don't have a particular favourite uh, of Rothko's, but just anything by Rothko, really. Um, Four, what is your favourite architectural marvel? Well, it's one I've never visited. I've only seen, obviously, pictures and documentaries and some of the friezes that have been stolen from it, which is a, a disgrace. Uh, and that's the, the Temple of Angkor Wat uh, in Cambodia. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's very big. I think it was, a you know, possibly is still the largest religious uh, building in the world. Um, and it's just stunningly beautiful. Uh, the friezes I, I saw that had been ripped from it uh, in a museum in, in Paris, they'd lowered the lights, so there were all these sort of Buddhas and things sort of staring at you from the, from the friezes. And it's the most spiritual I've ever atmosphere that I've ever been in, you know, much more than a church or a synagogue or whatever, just being in that room with the lights low and all these Buddhas looking at you. It was, it was a fabulous experience. And unfortunately, that museum has moved and gone to new premises, and I suspect they have not recreated that experience. And then there's the whole thing about, uh, you know, the fact that it had to be reclaimed for the jungle, that it had been abandoned, I think, due to sort of issues with drinking water. And it was completely forgotten about, and a French explorer rediscovered it in the 18th or 19th century, and it had to be reclaimed from the jungle. And then all the whole stuff about, you know, the, the Khmer Rouge and how they sort of uh, used it as part of their symbology. It's just so rich in my mind. You know, I'm obsessed with Cambodia. Um, five, what Shakespeare play would you want to be the lead in? Well, I don't want to be the lead in any of the tragedies because they will die because that's why they're tragedies. I don't want to be the lead in any of the comedies because they're not very funny on the whole. I wouldn't mind one of the cross-dressing ones. Is, is it As You Like It, where there's a wrestler who drew, pretends to be a woman? I mean, it's it's been a while since I've read that play. That might be quite fun. But actually, I think I'd go for one of the really way out plays. Uh, I think it's Titus Andronicus, where there's lots of death and serving of human beings up in pies and things like that. So, yeah, I don't know if the lead is the one who does all of those nasty things, but that sounds like fun to play in. Six. How many languages do you speak and which language, language would you most like to learn? It's a shame they use the word speak because, I, you know, apart from English, I don't speak any language, but I can read in a couple. I can read in French and I can read in, in classical Hebrew, uh, you know, the stuff that the Old Testament was written in. Uh, although while I can still understand French that I read, it's been a long time and I probably have forgot most of the vocabulary of my classical Hebrew. Um, the language I would most like to, to learn, and I've said this several times, is German, because not only the links between German and English, uh, but also that whole concept you have in German of um, compound words, when the words you, you're stretching for and as a writer, I find this a lot, doesn't exist. So you just sort of conceptually construct it out of other words. I mean, I love that capacity in German. And I also like the fact that all German nouns are capitalised. And I've I've done a, two or three short stories involving aspects of German sort of grammar and language. Um, so yeah, I mean it's a bit late in the day to try and wedge new uh, a new language into my head. But you know, if I had li my life over again, I would do German. Certainly, I do German instead of Latin, which is the option my father chose for me at school. It was German, Spanish, or Latin, and I got stuck with Latin. Um, Seven, what is your favourite quote from poetry, prose, plays, etc.? I'm really bad with quotes because I can never remember them. And, I, you know, even though I'm a writer, I don't keep a commonplace books for quotes, which is just a habit I've never got into. Which I, again, I, in retrospect, I kind of um, regret. One of the few quotes I do remember is, A, because it's pithy, and B, because I use it as one of the epigraphs in my uh, novel coming out next year. And that's part of the po a poem from Philip Larkin. And the quote is, they fuck you up, your mum and dad. They don't mean to, but they do. Um, which is absolutely apposite for my book called Stories uh, We Tell Our Children. Um, but there is one that, um, funny enough, was also going to be an epigraph for that book, but has been struck out by mutual agreement between me and the editor. This is, again, from uh, Scarlett Thomas. 
the author I spoke of earlier, her book, uh, Our Tragic Universe, not this one. And the quote is, and, you know, I, I love this quote, and it makes me think when it, whenever I reflect on it about my own writing. We should have stories, not to tell us how to live and turn our lives into copies of stories, but to prevent us from having to fictionalise ourselves. That's just so rich. And it's an interesting book, uh, Our Tragic Universe, in that... It's in some ways it's unreadable because it's a plotless novel and and, and sort of a very avowedly so that that's its stated purpose at the beginning of uh, someone who's doing a study of non-Western narrative traditions. And whenever anything happens, it happens off page. You know, it's never described. It's only sort of people's reactions to it. And it's mainly about people sort of you know going around to each other's houses and having tea. So on one level. It's a hard read because you just think, well, nothing's happening. But actually, the the ideas behind it are just tremendous. I think you have to be a bit of a hardcore Scarlet Thomas fan to to be able to read it. Uh, I am. Um, eight. Which fictional character's death is your ideal way to go? No, 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 no. I have a terror of death, so there is no ideal way to go. Um, if only death were fictional. And I have written a, an as yet unpublished novella all about first person death, you know, sort of, um, which sort of looks into some of the, the ideas and, and some of the sort of ways we as a human species keep death remote and at bay and not having to think about it on a daily basis. Um, Nine, what university or college would you most like to attend? Well, at my age of 56, I certainly wouldn't want to go back to university, even if it was to do one of those courses or a PhD where it's basically creative writing and you, you come out at the end of it with a with a novel. I, I You know, I did my time. Uh, I didn't have a very good experience of it. Although, again, in terms of if just for the aesthetics, I, you know, I had the, the supreme privilege of attending Cambridge University one of the colleges there, and it's a very, very beautiful town. And I was in the oldest college, which was established, I think, in 1211. I may have that wrong. Uh, maybe it was, yeah, I think it was 1211 or 1311. And for two of the years, no, in fact, for, yeah, for two and three years I was there, I lived in the oldest part of the college and very, very beautiful. So, if I was forced with a gun at my head to go back to university at age 56, I'd go to Cam back to Cambridge, but I'd choose a different college just for that different experience. So um, I always found Churchill old, old Court very beautiful, but the rest of the college wasn't that nice. Uh, not Churchill, sorry, Corpus Christi. Churchill's one of the modern builds, so I don't know how I managed to mix them up. And my cousin went to Clare College, Cambridge, and... His toilet window overlooked King's College Chapel. I mean, what a view that was. So, again, that was one of the... But, I don't know, I, King's College was a bit of a cliché architecture-wise for me, so I, I wouldn't particularly want to attend there. Um, Queen's College, I think, is the most beautiful. It has still a lot of its Tudor... Uh, a lot of its sort of Tudor architecture, and it had a bridge there that uh, Sir Isaac Newton built without using nails. Um, question 10 what is your murder weapon or murder method of choice now this is an interesting question really because I have written a couple of novels which involve killing people um, when I was uh, sort of spoofing genres um, but in real life I don't think I could murder someone not just because of the moral uh, prohibition but you know I'm squeamish I would faint at the sight of blood so I couldn't do it up close and personal like a, a, a knife or a garrote or strangle with my hands. I couldn't do anything like a gun, which would be very bloody. So I don't actually know I have an answer to this. I think if I could sort of get slightly um, arty about it. I really like the means of dispatch in Kafka's uh, short story In the Penal Colony, in which the method of execution first inscribes the crime and the guilt of the of the person being executed on their body, and it literally inscribes it in flesh. And the process of doing that ends up killing the person. I think that's quite quite a, a sort of ingenious device. Um, Eleven. What mythology would you most like to be part of? None. 
Uh, I don't do mythologies. Uh, 12. If you had to do a PhD, what would you choose to do it on? Again, this is kind of interesting. I, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer on this. One of the things I'd like to do is look at the work of David Markson, or at least the later works of David Markson, try and figure out how they work as literature when they don't really involve any fiction at all, and yet are avowedly novels. Uh, another thing that I would quite like to do is to look at that art across various art forms that deconstructs itself as its own subject matter. And I don't mean metafiction. I don't mean self-referential. So to give an example, the comedian Stuart Lee is always deconstructing his act as he delivers the act. Um, you know, his his manipulation of the audience of their emotions and of their feelings and where they should be in re in in regards to his act i mean I, I think he's a genius and i would like to consider that sort of mechanism across several art forms um 13 which fictional character would you die for i don't really understand this question i'm not sure there is a fictional character i'd die for but someone i feel very protective of is the main character in anna burns's milkman as she's walking through the streets of um, of uh, civil strife in in Belfast, and then there's a series of rapid fire uh, questions. I've just picked one from the other. One leather bound or cloth bound books. Well, I've never really thought about it to be honest, but I guess I would. You know, I wouldn't want a leather bound book now. And um, this is very similar to Andrea's answer. I wouldn't want a leather bound book now because of the calf that had to die you know, for it to be made. So that would lead towards cloth-bound cloth, cloth -bound books, but I've never really sort of considered it. Uh, two, dog-earing pages or highlighting pages? I'm afraid I do both, although, recent, you know, in the last two or three years, I've really got lazy and I dog-ear much more than I highlight, but I wouldn't rule out highlight. And uh, I do have a somewhere here behind me a, a, a loads of highlighter pens. Um, three, sculpture or paintings? Just paintings, but I mean, I'm a big fan of both because sculptures give you textures. I know someone like Rothko can give you textures in paint, but um, I also am a big fan of the non figurative, and it's much harder to be non figurative in sculpture. It's possible, but it's you know, it's harder. Uh, four piano or violin, neither. I'm a, a bass guitar man. Um, having said that, I was put down by my parents at age seven to learn the violin at my new school and I never turned up to a single lesson and I've used that anecdote because there was a lot around it uh, in a short story I say short story it's 20,000 words so it's probably a novella that I will be giving away uh, in association with my new novel next next year because it's it's sort of associated with the novel but at that particular section in that story about violin lessons and not attending was directly cold from my own personal experience. So I guess I'm quite grateful to the violin, even though I never, you know, <laughs> plucked a string in my life. Um, five, films or theatre? Well, at this stage in my life, neither. Um, I do, you know, in my theatre-going past when I was writing plays, I guess I was fairly wedded to it. But I turned my back on theatre as it turned its back on me as a playwright. And I've never really gone back. I still hold about 10 plays, sacrosanct and sacred, I guess. And films, well, yeah, I kind of think films are a dumb medium compared to, to literature. I'm sorry, Jason, uh, but you probably know that by now. One of my biggest beasts with, with films is that they, too often they start from um, works in literature rather than come up with their own medium-centred original scripts um and you know, that's not to say there aren't good films of course there are they're great films but i guess my top 10 films do not move me intellectually spiritually and artistically as my top 10 theater plays uh six poetry or prose prose all day long i'm afraid um seven museums or bookshops bookshops i think i mean I can get a lot more information and learn about new things from museums, obviously, but I prefer being in bookshops. Um, eight, smell of books or smell of coffee or tea? Well, I don't drink tea or coffee, so by default, it's the smell of books. Nine, fountain pen or typewriter? Well, neither. 
Uh, I have used both in the past. But, you know, for me, the technological advances by which we have keyboards on laptops is is fantastic. Um, I will say that when I did use a typewriter, the one thing that stymied me was doing corrections, be it liquid paper or correcting ribbons or whatever. So you very rarely, or I very rarely, not being a, a touch typist, came out with a full script where I didn't have to retype sections of it because of the, the, the errors. And while it's true in, you know, handwritten with a fountain pen, um, it's just an easier refit. It's just to cross it out. Um, yeah. Um, Ten, new or used books. I really have no preference. I don't mind. I suppose uh, in terms of once I've read a book and it's in my bookshelf, I prefer it to be a new book just because it's you know, better condition on the whole But I, you know, in terms of my buying decisions, it's about the book I'm trying to get hold of, and a lot of those are no longer in print. Um, I'm not someone who needs a particular edition of a book or or is bothered by the cover art. Um, but yeah, I really have no preference. So there you have it. Thanks very much to Andrea uh, and whoever the the originator of this this tag was. Um, I am going to uh, tag Brian over at Bookish, uh, Cilia over at Cilia, and Elizabeth at Bookish North. Uh, go for it, guys. Till next time. Thanks very much.